Good to have all of you with us. Welcome. I wanted to ask you uh, your favorite constellation. And uh, while we're waiting for folks to arrive, just you could either put the number in the chat or you can, um, some of you might have the annotations option. So you go along, if you just hover along the top, you'll see a gray bar that comes up and if it's a zoom bar. And then if you scroll down on the view options button, you'll find the annotate in the menu below. And then you can draw and pick your colors and have some fun. This one often doesn't work on a mobile devices, a phone or a tablet, and some computers also won't have it, but many do. Um, so let us know if uh, it works really well in meetings, um, in the meeting setting, but this is a webinar setting, so you might not have as many options today. You can also put the number in the chat. You don't have to, um, you don't have to annotate it. I have. Mm -hmm. Orion and Ursa Major. Oh, yeah. Big Scorpio Dipper. Scorpio is mine, and it's number one. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's sometimes we've seen it available in the webinar format, but also sometimes it isn't. So we like to give options for both because then um, everybody can participate, even the folks that don't have annotation. I know Chromebooks have a hard time as well as Vivian was mentioning. Um, if you're using mobile devices. Excellent. Okay. Well, there you go. It's difficult to choose. <laughs> yes, it sure is. There's so many um, favorite constellations and um, yeah. These are just mine ones is Sagittarius. That are, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think mine's Sagittarius. I like um, the hunt, the, it, it looks like a teapot to me. Yeah, I love that it's the steam of the Milky Way going up into the sky, yeah. coming out of the teapot. Okay, so that's an, an activity you can do while you're with the girls, either virtually or in person. I want to welcome you because uh, we have been uh, doing this workshop for a while, but it's mainly been with amateur astronomers and museum educators. And this session is specifically for uh, people who are working with Girl Scouts, either as staff, volunteers, or girls who are working with younger girls. Um, and we're happy to have um, anyone who is here, um, but we also want to specifically talk about some more astronomy activities activities you can do. Um, we're also going to be talking about some outreach techniques that will um, be more girl friendly and make your outreach more accessible. This is part of a grant from NASA called Reaching for the Star Stars. NASA Science for Girl Scouts. And we already created uh, new space science badges for all levels of Girl Scouts from kindergartners, five and six year olds, all the way up to seniors in high school. Uh, and we are still in the process of connecting Girl Scouts and astronomers and building great girl experiences in astronomy. So it's been a really wonderful grant and we're happy that we can do this uh, towards the end. It's just meet with you and explore some of these ideas. We uh, are, I'm Teresa Summer and my colleague is Vivian White. And we work at the ASP, which is an organization that's dedicated to sharing astronomy with the public. Uh, we've been around for about 130 years, but not that many of the public know us. So we are always um, getting the word out about uh, our astronomy activities. You might have gotten a kit if you're in the Night Sky Network um, or know some of our resources that we share there. Um, Vivian, would you like to say anything more? No, that's okay. We do all sorts of informal astronomy outreach as well as formal astronomy outreach um, at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So you may see us around. It's true. Yeah. Um, um, I just wanted to share what we are going to be working on today. So we hope that you take some of the information we have today. We'll be exploring some uh, facilitation techniques that work well, both virtually and in person. So we know that we've got lots of um, 
uh, different types of outreach happening right now because of the pandemic. And uh, maybe some of your outreach will continue virtually. Um, so we'll be looking at techniques uh, for both in-person and virtual. And then we're also gonna get uh, familiar with some of these activities that are part of the space science badges. Um, for Daisy and Brownie in particular, the youngest of the Girl Scouts. We'd love if you take this information and then get to do an event with it. We hope you um, uh, have lots of time to do that. And if you're not already connected with the council, connect with a local council near you. It sounds like a lot of you are already here from council. So welcome. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the Night Sky Network. Um, Teresa, I think there's a, something in front of your screen on the left. Thanks. So the Night Sky Network is a group of amateur astronomers across the US and we are, um, there are about 400 clubs. So there's very likely an astronomy club near you. And each of these badges that we've created, we created six all the way from kindergarten through till um, seniors in high school. Um, each of them have a step that connects you with either your local planetarium or a science center or an astronomy club. Astronomy clubs can be a great resource for doing astronomy outreach, especially the places where you want to do observing. So they often bring um, telescopes and uh, and such to either you can go to an event of theirs or maybe they'll be at a local school and your troop can join them. So I'll be sharing all of the um, URLs for every resource that we give at the end. You'll get an email tomorrow with lots more information with all of those um, URLs linked to a place with all of the URLs. But um, the Night Sky Network also has tips for doing uh, great outreach. So how to, um, if, example, for example, if you haven't been doing them already, how to do um, online events, um, also outreach events like um, great ways to talk to children, how to answer when you don't know something. If you have any reservations about doing um, outreach with kids, this is a great resource. Um, so we encourage you to connect with your local astronomy club who's already doing all this great outreach. Um, and um, so we'll just give you additional tools uh, there if you need it. it has in addition, tons and tons of astronomy outreach activities. So if there's something that's not covered today that you wanna do a, 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 some sort of uh, event around say, aliens. <laughs> we have lots of things on extrasolar planets, for example, lots of activities you can use. So I encourage you to check that out afterwards. Thanks, Vivian. And I'm going to share a technique that we use often um, when we're doing uh, outreach. It's a good communication tool for girls, boys, and everyone, basically. Uh, mindset is this idea of an established set of attitudes and beliefs. Um, it could be something we don't even realize that we have, but it's kind of a guideline for how we live our lives. And today I'm going to be talking about two mindsets, uh, growth and fixed. Let's start with fixed, right? Um, a fixed mindset is where you believe that your intelligence and your abilities are inborn, right? And they're fixed traits. Uh, what this looks like is someone who knows all the facts, right? Or believes that they're a science person, uh, especially in this definition that's by Carol Dweck. Um, she talks about documenting your intelligence or talents instead of developing them. Um, some ways that this might play out in the world is uh, the sage on the stage who knows it all, or someone who sticks to what you know, because that's just who I am. Um, if the success had made meant that they were intelligent, then the less the successful were not intelligent. Uh, and it, it can be a little bit of a trap. Let's talk about some of the phrases we might have heard growing up, like, you're so smart or I guess you aren't a math person, or this could be an art person, or a um, you could be a natural born soccer player, right? It, these are ideas that what you are and what you do is based on your inherent nature, right? Um, it turns out that our abilities are a lot more flexible than we think. 
um, based on research that's been going on since the 1980s. I mentioned Dr. Carol Dweck, but also Joe Baller had this idea um, that we can learn and grow, right? Um, so just let's spend a minute more with the fixed mindset. How do people with fixed mindset respond to life's challenges, right? Um, if you've been told you're a math person your whole life and then you have to struggle with math, you might kind of go away from it because um, if you fail, then you can't show people how smart you are, right? So it doesn't give you a lot of room to try and fail and then succeed. So you basically avoid challenges. And if you fail something, you're stuck there. That's the limit of what you can do. Now, this different approach is the idea that you can always learn something new. This came about um, because they gave kids a test and they told them, the children, half of them were told that this is for smart people. And half were told that this is for people who really try hard. And the test, uh, unbeknownst to the kids, was actually a lot harder um, than their grade level was. But the kids that were told that it was for um, people who worked hard kept working at it and did very well on the test. Whereas the kids who were told that this is for smart people, they actually did worse, even when they were the kids that the teachers would say, oh, this is the smart kid in my class, right? So um, the growth mindset can really be an interesting idea. This is the idea that you can learn anything with effort. So, um, you work on things, you try hard, and you um, build on your growing body of knowledge or talents, right? So um, in the chat right now, I'd like you to write one thing that you could do now that you can't, you couldn't do as an infant. Something you can do that you learned how to do as either an adult or a Toddler. Tiffany says read. Ashley says hand build ceramics. That's so cool. Um, walk, read, and use a telescope, says Erin. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a while, especially for us in astronomy. We know that you don't learn the sky in one day. You need to use a telescope. And, and figure out how it works and uh, find things in the sky, right? So uh, what you do is you build a body of knowledge, right? Um, for myself, switching from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset has been really challenging um, because I was told I was smart. I was a science person, but those things, um, can really be a, a trap, right? So we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I want to say is that there's two benefits for presenting yourself as a person who's growing and learning, right? Um, it shows that there's not science people, right? Anyone can learn science if they are interested and put in the effort. Um, and it also shows that girls can fail, right? They can still be courageous and scientific um, and failure can be a wonderful tool to grow, right? So um, I really want to encourage you to try to use some um, growth mindset language. So let's take a look at some of this language. I just also wanted to, um, before you go on, the practice makes progress part. I think a lot of us grew up with practice makes perfect. And as the leaders of some of these activities we're about to do in a minute, um, you know, it's important to show that we are also learning. I think that's a, a really important piece to show the girls that we don't come knowing everything um, and neither should they. So, so um, showing as we're doing things, what it looks like to learn something new is also very valuable. Yeah. True. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to, I'll take us on the group activity if you'd like, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is an activity that we put together uh, when we originally started this grant. Uh, it was in person. We did these with astronomy clubs, but um, we also have an online version and Teresa is going to pull up a poll in a minute. What we're going to do is um, we're going to look at some different phrases. Oh. Um, and uh, we're going to 
decide together. It's an anonymous poll. So uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll show you a phrase and you will get to vote in the poll on whether you'd like a, whether you think it's a fixed mindset or a growth mindset or whether you're not sure. All right. Um, so we'll... those are the three choices and I'm going so. to show you the phrase now and launch the poll. All right. So we'll start with an easy one because if you were listening, you might've heard something about this. You really are a science person. Does anybody want to pop in the poll whether you think this is a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? We have some answers coming in. And Teresa, I think your poll is right in front of the question. I know it's going to go Thank like you that. For telling me that. No worries. All right. You are really, you really are a science person. We have a lot of folks coming, things coming in. Yeah. And most of it is saying that there's a fixed mindset, some growth mindset. So I'm not sure. Here, let me show you guys what. Yeah. yeah. All right. So about 83% thought fixed mindset, right? So this is a pretty fixed mindset, even though it's a positive statement, right? You really are a science person. It sounds like, hey, that's great. You're a science person. Um, however, it is putting them in a box and saying you are a science person. So as soon as science, something in science does not come easily to them, it can be, they can feel like, oh, I thought I was a science person, but maybe I'm not a science person. So just a few suggestions for something you could say instead of you really are a science person. You can say like, I can tell you have a passion for science or even better, praise the process. So instead of praising the person, you can say you're thinking like a scientist, right? Praise what they're doing that makes them look like a scientist. Or um, I really love how you're trying all those tactics until you get the solution. All right, let's try another one. Here's another phrase. Thanks. Right. It All can right. be challenging to learn the night sky. So after tonight, you'll be even better than at it. And I, good. Yeah, we're going to reset the poll and you'll get to try again. Okay. All right. There we go. It can be challenging to learn the night sky. So after tonight, you're going to be even better at it. A lot of people coming in. Yeah, and we got uh, it. And most of them are saying it's a growth mindset. Wow, you all are learning a lot today. <laughs> I can tell you're getting the hang of this. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a growth mindset. Uh, talking about challenges is not um, going to dissuade someone from doing it. Um, so that's a that's a very growth mindset um, statement. Well done. After tonight, you're going to be even better at it. Let's try one or two more. Here's one more. Your practice is paying off. All right. Let me just launch the poll. Awesome. Yep. I think this crew practice is paying off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Exactly. Um, this is much better than saying that you're naturally talented at something. Um, because the truth is like, we all have both mindsets. I, I certainly hear myself saying, Oh, I am not a cook when I'm looking at what to make for dinner tonight. Right. And I have to think about that. And I'm like, oh, that's not a growth mindset. I, <laughs> I can certainly learn to cook. Um, uh, so you can feel confident. Can in I one give you area. just one more phrase? Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's because adjusting the telescope is hard. Let me find that for you. All right. Let's try that. Adjusting the telescope is hard. Let me find that for you. Um, you I was just going to say you can feel confident and experienced in one area and you're still learning and um, uh, having trouble in another area. So, uh, yeah, this is a little bit harder, right? Because yeah. it, I, there, there's some that are coming in, not sure, some fixed mindset, some growth mindset. Let me share the results with you. Great. Right. Um, 
So yeah, this is a, a tricky one because yes, <laughs> adjusting the telescope is hard, but you're, what you're saying is let me find that for you. You can't do it, but I can do it for you. Um, and so sometimes with telescopes, we do want to take care of them and make sure that they don't go to a different area of the sky. But also, um, if we can, if you have a different telescope, you can bring an extra one, you can say uh, something like, you know, this is, might take you a little while, but I bet if you put in the time and effort, you can learn this, you can handle the frustration. Or you could say something like it was hard for me at first, too. So I know you're going to be able to get this. A lot of girls are actually in astronomy clubs now and doing this sharing. And so um, we hope that the people who are on this poll will also be doing that kind of thing. Great. Uh, um, this one's a, another one that's pretty easy. Should we do it real quick? Let's go ahead and skip that one. Oh, yeah, you got yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's All right. That one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, You're... this is, uh, again, a, a growth is a fixed mindset phrase, right? Because it's saying somebody is smart, even though it's a favorable thing to be smart. You also want to say that smart takes effort, right? So you could say something like, I put love that you put so much effort into figuring out how to solve that problem. The other issue is that um, you're so smart can kind of become a trap. As I was mentioning earlier, it makes people not want to try because when it gets hard, they the the hardness contradicts the way they think about themselves if they struggle then maybe they aren't so smart right you always have to be the smart one if you're a smart person right? um, a lot of people respond to this when we have these workshops because they were that smart one right um, also if you're having a connection with a girl at the telescope there's usually a line behind and all the other girls are wondering, oh, am I gonna get told I'm so smart? It's like a, a special plum that you gave that girl and are they gonna get it too? Or are you gonna just be like, oh yeah, move on. You know, um, another thing is that it's really um, vague and children don't know. They're very sensitive to criticism and praise, um, but they don't know what that means. So, using something that talks about the process that they're doing, like what their actions are, really can make um, a girl notice how she's improving and working. So you can say you worked really hard on getting that telescope focus and your effort really shows, or look at this beautiful star chart you made. Um, you did work so hard on that. Um, so you really wanna talk about what they're doing and especially, if you can notice some of the scientific things that they're doing. Uh, I want you to call out the specific skills. Like, I like the way you focus that telescope or it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, something else I wanna mention is that um, somebody who might seem to be smart and there are many people who are smart in many, many different ways, um, but it, they might just have had um, exposure to astronomy before and people have different access to different resources. So somebody whose parents work all weekend long might not be able to go to a museum on the weekends with them. And so it's just about um, looking at their interests, looking at what's going on rather than knowing if they know specific knowledge. One last thing, right, um, with growth mindset. Uh, Vivian mentioned she's not good at cooking, but you can always say you're not good at cooking yet, right? You can improve, you can get better at cooking. You just um, don't put yourself down. Don't let girls put themselves down. Just add this word yet. Um, the learning to use a growth mindset is a challenging process especially if you grew up hearing lots of gross mindset, of fixed mindset phrases. So um, this word yet can be very magical. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the space science badges. And um, we're gonna review two badges each session. So this is the first session of three and they're all independent. You don't need to come to them all, but you will get um, the YouTube link for all of the recordings.
So today we're going to talk about the youngest Girl Scouts, the daisies and the brownies and their badges. So the youngest Girl Scouts are very young, right? They are in kindergarten and first grade if they're a daisy or in second and third grade if they're brownies. So with kindergarten, someone might be four or five years old. Um, for brownies, they are um, seven to nine. Um, so these are very young, right? Um, and so we're going to talk about the ages and stages that they are in and what you can do to make them feel more comfortable. Um, these slides are uh, taken from someone else who was on the grant uh, partially. Um, her name was Jessica Henricks, and she was formerly of Girl Scouts NorCal, and she's an amazing STEM and STEAM educator. And so... Um, some of these slides are from her because she was part of our grant and has great Girl Scout knowledge. Um, so we're going to start with the Daisy Space Science Explorer badge, right? And exploring is what tiny kids can do, right? They um, are going to explore and observe the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, again, the girls are five to seven years old, right? So they are wiggly. They are... Um, want to move around. They like imagining and being creative. So you really want to be animated, speak clearly and directly to them. If you can get some of those wiggles out. Um, another thing is that um, some of them might not be so good at Zoom or at reading. Um, they're just learning those things. Um, so think about where they're at and expect that there's going to be um, maybe a mom or dad or, or troop leader with them. Also, when you're talking about astronomy concepts, make sure you're using fun graphics. These are from um, NASA Space Place um, and use simple words like, oh, the moon always keeps the same face towards earth. You can still use um, um, cartoons or words to get across scientific examples. With the brownies, they're a little bit older, they mostly know how to read by now, and they're writing and they're exploring, and so they are investigating the sun, the moon, the planets, and stars. Sound kind of familiar? <laughs> Uh, here's some listing of different act, age appropriate activities um, using emojis and thumb pulls, ups and downs. Um, you really don't want to type too much, but it's okay to use some of that. They will have learned that by now as most of us have during this pandemic. Um, here's something you can do with uh, graphics, right? Uh, this is something you can do that's pretty simple and because brownies know how to use the chat, you can ask them to either annotate or put things in the chat like, what planet are you today? How are you feeling? Are you... Um, like Mars and happy and very excited? Or are you like uh, Neptune, all cold and worried? If so you, you all want to put, put that in the chat yourselves, you can tell us how you're feeling, what planet you're feeling like today, which you can just put it by the number. And you don't even have to talk about which planets these are. These are more of just a feeling kind of temperature gauge. Um, I'm feeling a little sideways. <laughs> Take number three. <laughs> yeah, I think of that as like goofy, which oh. the girls might really enjoy. <laughs> Great. I see a, a few different ones. And you could put, if you know the names, put them in. Yeah, Saturn or Mars or one or three. That's another way you can use graphics. Um, so today we're going to look at the moon, planets, and star activities. When I was saying, do they sound familiar? A lot of these activities um, kind of overlap. And that was intentional because a lot of the girls um, are in families or multiple level troops, meaning that they might have somebody who's a brownie who has a daisy sister who's also going to be in the meeting with them. So um, a troop might not be just one level. So these um, three areas are topics we can talk about um, for both badges. 
and, and just a little bit different levels. Okay. I think I'll kick us off with the moon to get started with. So we'll um, we'll look at the moon first, and then planets, and then stars, and we'll show you how to use them for both daisies and brownies. So we don't have to cover the same material twice. So um, with the moon, a lot of what we do is observing, right? So um, each of these badges has a basic observe the moon step. Um, but of course, brownies are a little more advanced, so we're going to get into a little bit more um, information. But first, I have a joke for you. Hey, Teresa, <laughs> why did the moon put down its fork? Oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> It's really good to start with jokes. Okay, well, tell me, Vivian, why <laughs> did the moon put down its fork? <laughs> because it was full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I love starting with jokes and incorporating silliness into the um, outreach with younger girls. It's especially fun because they are so lovely and often quite goofy. Um, so, uh, when we are talking about the moon, besides starting with jokes, uh, of course, one of those things that we are talking about, starting with opening, open-ended questions, we can just ask a question like, what moon phase did you all see last? So um, if you want to, I'm going to ask that question, actually, of you all. Uh, what moon phase do you remember seeing last? When was the last time you looked up at the moon and what did it look like? And of course, if you're in person, if you're interactive, um, this can be very exciting and they will tell you all about what it looked like, whether it was a banana or, you know, what kind of fruit it looked like or <laughs> uh, third quarter. Oh, OK. Number four. Right. We've got um, a lot of quarter moons. So they're not going to know necessarily all the phase names um, and it's OK if they don't remember at all. Um, you can all ask them, <laughs> right, <laughs> Tiffany, uh, it's been totally cloudy here in uh, the Bay Area, so we also have not seen the moon in a while. <laughs> totally fine. Um, it's okay if they don't know. Um, and uh, we can start with just this. And then when the girls are a little bit older, that observing piece is actually really great at both ages. But when you get to be a brownie, when you're in um, uh, second and third grade, you can start to make predictions about what comes next? Predictions are just guesses and you want girls to feel comfortable guessing. So um, we have a moon guessing game. Now with daisies, who are the young ones, they're just mostly observing and making note of patterns. So the badge book has a moon book within it as well, um, where they can draw the moon every time they see it, which is really fun. Brownies get to do a little bit more thoughtful prediction, um, as well as make some observations to test out their predictions, which is great. Um, so those are two of the moon activities you can do. I wanted to give you a few cool gifts. Um, this is uh, a neat one from NASA. You can just let them watch it. It's really lovely and soothing. You can find today's moon phase. Um, I want to encourage you, especially at this young age, not to begin teaching why the moon has phases. They are simply not ready for a 3D model that works in that way. Um, this is too young for their brains to think in that way. We are able to process different kinds of information at different ages, and they're not ready for, the, most of the girls are not gonna be ready for uh, comprehending why the moon has phases. What they are ready for is stories. <laughs> So this is one of my favorite activities. Um, it's called Moon Myths from Around the World. Uh, this is on the Night Sky Network, and we'll give you that link. This has, um, I think, about seven or eight different cards from uh, legends around the world of what people see in the moon. I'll just tell you this one quickly. You don't have to memorize any of these. They're all written on the cards. But here you go. This one is one from Mexico, from the ancient Aztecs. So in long, long ago, an Aztec god chose to set himself on fire and jump into the sky in order to light up this cold, dark world. And he became the sun. But a second god, jealous of the praise that the new sun was getting, he did the same thing. All of that light was too bright and it angered a third god who threw a rabbit at that second sun's face to dim his light making him the moon. 
So the Aztecs saw a rabbit on the moon and many of the current myths in Mexico still see a rabbit on the moon. Many people in general see a rabbit on the moon. So these are some of the myths from around the world um, that you can talk to the girls about. Yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, and then you can create your own moon story, right? So look at these dark and light parts of the moon and use your imagination to create stories of what you see on there. They can draw on the picture and then also write. This kind of gives them something that they're very comfortable with drawing, um, as well as for the second and third graders who are writing and practicing writing, it gives them something to practice. Um, the younger, the brownies, uh, sorry, the daisies will still need a lot of help with the writing piece. So you may have to dictate for them, uh, whatever they say, but this is one of my favorite activities um, to, send home with girls because it's a great one to keep kind of on the fridge. Um, yeah. All right. I think I'm going to take it. You want to take it over for planets, Teresa? Sure. Um, thanks, Vivian, for that. I, I really love having kids um, tell stories. Uh, and it's one of my favorite keepsakes from outreach question, outreach sessions, rather. Um, so when we're starting something new, like we're just starting the planets, asking a question is a great way to start that. So um, what is one thing you have heard about the planets? Um, please put that in the chat. Uh, I know that some of you might know a lot about planets <laughs> um, and we could talk about planets all day, but just one thing that they you find that's cool. Um, asking the girls questions, um, not only helps us find out what they know, but it also lets them share proudly their existing knowledge. And it makes the girls learn from each other because they're sharing their interests. And so um, just write in the chat one thing that you've heard about planets. Jupiter is big and gassy, Vivian, but um, Jupiter has the most moons. Pluto's surface is smaller in, than Russia. Wow. I did not know that. Russia is very big though. Uh, Mars is red, yeah. Some are rocky, some are gaseous, different things about different types of planets. Great. So these are all kinds of um, information that you guys have already about the planets. And if you start with an open-ended question, you can really get a lot of information. So, um, when I was just reading out in the chat, I would recommend that you say, Aaron says that Jupiter has the most moons, um, because when you call a girl by their name, it's really exciting for them, even if it's virtually, right? Um, also, um, they might have heard some misinformation, right? That's out there in the world. So something they might have heard about planets might be completely un, um, un incorrect. However, this is not the time for that. Um, you can correct them while you're learning about the things, um, but wait until then. Uh, don't start with saying you're wrong. Let them learn by looking through the telescope and finding out, oh, Mars is red. Okay. Oh. Another goofy thing that we like to do with the youngest girls is um, this comes from Jean Fahey, who is another great um, STEAM educator, uh, worked with the Girl Scouts of Northern California for many, many years, and one of my sheroes. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to move a little bit, and I know that you don't have to because I can't see you, but don't worry, nobody else can either. So go ahead and move with me because we're going to do a planet pantomime. Um, you could do this with all of any of the um, planets, but we just made up a few here. This, or Gene, I would, should say, made up a few. We're going to act out one fun fact about each planet. Are you ready? We're going to start with the planet closest to the sun, Mercury. It has only two sunrises for every of our Earth years. That seems like um, it would be a very big deal to see a sunrise. So I want you to act amazed when you see only one of two sunrises for a whole 360 days. So, oh, wow, imagine how rare that would be. We get to see one every day. How lucky are we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to Venus. Uh, Venus has a very active surface, including volcanoes. So go ahead, 
I can't see you. Nobody can see you. Act like a volcano. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa, for playing along with me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Lots of smoke. Um, and let's go last but not least. Let's try Earth. It's the only planet that I would want to live on because it's the only one that supports life. I want everybody to take just a moment to take a deep breath of this beautiful Earth air. <sighs> We are so lucky to be here on earth um, and have our atmosphere that surrounds us and supports us. So having them act out fun things can be a great way to give little factoids so they have more information about the different planets. You can uh, make it active uh, by acting things out. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. I love doing those planet pantomimes. Um, yeah, any kind of movement that you can connect with science knowledge is, is a great thing to do with the girls. I'm going to talk about the stars and um, the daisies have the step three. It's just meet the stars. Uh, the brownies have two steps where one is where they're seeing more than before, where they can build a simple telescope um, from a kit or a um, you know, we have lots of kits that you can build telescopes from, or also um, being a stargazer. So they might go to a stargazing event, one that you might be having indeed. <laughs> so these two things are, are um, great ways that their badges already connect them with the stars, right? And they're talking about looking up. So there's a lot of shapes you can see in the sky. Um, I want you to now, if you can, put any constellations you know, or maybe just your favorite constellations, since we were talking about that earlier. Um, when you're introducing new concepts, use short, clear sentences, like, um, and also clear, um, clear, not constellations, but asterisms, right? You want to talk about the summer triangle for um, daisies, or you could talk about Cassiopeia, how it looks like a W or an M, right? Those, um, those simple letters, they probably are already learning. So that's a fun thing to talk about. Can I add one Just, thing, Teresa, that there is in the badge booklet, it shows some of the constellations, so you don't have to know them yourself, or you can always look it up online to see what's going to be up in the night sky tonight, so don't feel like you have to know all of them. Yeah, and for the, um, for the daisies, they have um, the Big Dipper, which is um, up a lot of the year, and they have, um, I think, Orion, so really big constellations that are up for a while. Okay. There. <laughs> so um, the constellations, you can talk about um, the name with the daisies, but really it's in the brownies, right? That they're patterns in the sky, sort of like connecting the dots. And a lot of them will have done those types of things, right? Um, they might not know that astronomers agree to use these same constellations as a grid. So if you're studying a black hole in Cygnus, that is an area where um, they'll know to look. It's um, so a lot of people um, will find that interesting that we kind of use the sky as a map for our learning, um, for talking about the research we're doing. Also, you might know those 88 constellations um, that we use to map the sky are mainly from the ancient Greeks, but people from all around the world have used stories about the stars um, pretty much since there's been people. Um, so this is the image of Orion, um, but also has many other cultures put in there. Um, if you go to this um, website, it's figures in the sky and they have different, um, cultures, interpretations of the same stars. So different people see different things depending on what is important to them. For example, let's look at this image of the sky. These are an area of the sky that have stars in there. And I just want you to take a moment to imagine and see how you could connect those dots. Does anyone this see anything? This is a resource that is on the Night Sky Network. And it has not only 
these pages that you can share with the girls, but you can also see some of the constellations that different cultures have. For example, the ancient Greeks saw Scorpio the scorpion in there, and maybe some of you can see that scorpion. Others of you might see the Hawaiian fish hook in there, or you might see um, something completely different. So it's fun to kind of look at the stars without the constellations and with the constellations. Ashley got it. Someone said that last time. It looked like a, a high heel shoe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> oh, let, let me go back so everybody could see that um, that shoe. I know. I thought I, that was just amazing. As an astronomer, it's very hard to unsee what we what we know this constellation to be, but I love the idea of a high heel shoe and, and kids come up with wonderful interpretations, so. You can also have the kids make a story and you can look at the stars in the sky and talk about that story um, with what's important to them. Like you can, um, different. there's different legends that each family has that each story, um, that's told that you can match to things in the sky and maybe you can't see your aunt who's a famous author in the sky but you could see a pen and talk about how she's a famous author those kind of short stories that the kids can make up are really great and fun activity and it's a bad step so um, these are activities that that really make um fun fun experiences for your girls There's one activity that's part of the badge as well called Constellation Viewers, and this has been really fun. So a page in the badge booklet uh, looks something like this on the left, and all you need is just a pair of scissors. Um, and you cut out each of these circles, or the girls can cut them out themselves, and uh, you apply it with a glue stick to the end of a paper cup Be sure to write their name on it. I love these. These are also from Jessica Hendricks. Um, and you poke a dot where each of the stars are and then shine a light you can even just use your cell phone light through the cup to project an image of the constellation on a dark wall um, so this is a very fun way for them to take home their own constellation get to know it and then um, look at when to find it in the sky so getting used to coming up with those patterns is uh, seeing those patterns and recognizing them is a nice step at this stage if you were going to do these in large groups, there's a picture in the middle there of a great tool um, that cuts out the appropriate sized um, circle. And you might just want to take one of these pages to a craft store and for sure they will have them. But we've done these in large conventions and Girl Scout events. Um, and it's nice to have something that punches them out so they can just start with the circle already. Um, yeah. All right. Um, oh, so we're actually sort of running towards uh, the top of our hour, um, but I, we wanted to end with a joke. So. Hey, Teresa. Yes. <laughs> How do you throw a space party? You have to plan it. <laughs> da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, Again, jokes are a fun way to uh, connect with your audience, but um, we also give you lots of different activity tips that uh, we talked about today with growth mindset and open ended questions and um, we're going to be talking about all of these things, um, but mostly keep it playful keep it fun. And that's going to have them have positive associations with doing astronomy activities. Um, another thing that is part of every Girl Scout gathering is the reflection piece. And so this usually is at the end of a meeting uh, that you take time to reconnect with each other and reflect on the things you've done, um, maybe what is one thing you've learned, uh, what is one thing you still want to learn more about. And so we actually love to get that feedback from you. And so there's an, a, a feedback form that we have that um, we're going to put the, in the chat now. And I would love it if you could, um, if we could fill that all out. It's in the chat. Vivian already put it 
Thank you. Very um, short. So just, just maybe. let us know how we did or what we can work on. And um, it really does help us improve and we put it into action. So the next um, session we have you, if you come back, you um, could participate and we will make it better. Um, so we have time for some questions. Oh no, permission to view the form. Thanks. I've got to have some oh, growth no. mindset around that. Give okay. While well, Vivian um, <laughs> uh, puts changes the permissions, I'm going to stop sharing so we can, and also stop the recording so that we can have some time to to ourselves to ask the questions. So hold on, just one moment. And we'll stop the recording. So thanks to everybody in YouTube land, and we will see you later. Everyone who's on, just stay on for a second.